Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to thank all of you for being here today um, and continuing as we have more questions. Um, I wanted to start with Mr. Padden. Just you haven't talked about localism at all, and with your proposal, how um, that would impact access to local information. Again, I'm just suggesting to you that uh, marketplace forces would be a better servant of consumers' interests. If there's programming they're interested in, whether it's local programming or something from somewhere else, and you leave it to the market and there's money to be made providing that program to them, they'll get it. And uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of the viewing is to local broadcast stations because of the overwhelming interest in uh, the local news and weather and, and sports, and in a free market system, that would continue. There'd be absolutely no diminution in, in that at all. all. And I mean, why you would want to continue a system that is based on the Nielsen ratings from 1972 to decide who gets to watch what, I, I don't understand. And, you know, with the new technology today, um, the Internet, people are getting a lot of local information even when they're not at home. Many of us, um, when we're here, are still staying connected at home and getting local information in other ways because um, we have people traveling around a lot and they're not always in their local area, but they still want news um, it, that's happening from home. Um, so given the development of new technologies and the different consumer behavior in terms of access to content, um, and making sure that we, given that we have legislation from 1988 and um, Nielsen Radish from earlier, um, how do we make sure that we put together policy that doesn't inhibit innovation or change going forward um, as we look at, you know, what we should do here in the next step? And so that's kind of a broad question for everyone, but we want to make sure that whatever we do addresses issues that consumers have today, but also doesn't block innovative new entrants that um, may also want to compete in this space. Mr. Donato, you were Yeah, nodding. I'd like to answer that, actually. Um, so we measure um, viewing of television online. Um, we've made an announcement. Um, it's a very complicated technical problem of measuring it through tablets, but we've made an announcement um, that we've solved the technology and starting the end of next year. Um, viewership on uh, tablets will also be included in the ratings. I suppose my point is um, we've got measurement solutions. Um, the business relationships um, are very, very complicated, and I wouldn't comment on them. I would leave it to my fellow, fellow panelists to comment on them, but we do have the measurement solutions um, worked out. Thank you. And if I could comment on, on the 1972 Nielsen data point, um, I think one thing that's missing from the record is that although theoretically DMAs can change based on viewership, and viewership is what is measured, if there's only one signal that's available in a DMA, when you check the viewership, you're going to get the same local affiliate over and over and over again. And in southwest Colorado, for example, which is, I mentioned is in the Albuquerque DMA, we've proposed to provide both Albuquerque and Denver to the folks in those two counties and let the consumers decide. So when Mr. Donato's firm calls them up, they can say, I'm listening to Albuquerque, I'm watching Albuquerque, and lo and behold, maybe the broadcasters are right. People down there prefer to buy their Chevrolets from Albuquerque, but some people might say I'm watching Denver, and ultimately it's, it's a vote of the people to decide where those two counties should be. I, you know, I said, your, I'm sorry. I said it before, but I, I don't understand the 1972 comment. Every year we evaluate viewership, and that's the basis on which DMAs are uh, constructed. So I wasn't just focused on 1972. I'm kind of focused on the speed of legislation and that, you know, the, the, the way people are viewing, um, the way the industry work changes more quickly sometimes than legislation does. So how do we make sure we put together legislation that doesn't inhibit that innovation? Well, if I could come back to your original question about technology. Technology is very exciting for broadcasters because, as you're probably well aware, with Slingbox and other technologies, watchabc.com, you can actually use the internet technologies to keep up with your local broadcaster even when you're in Washington, D.C. And, and with the uh, CBS issue with, with Time Warner, an important part of that was the online digital rights so that CBS could make that programming available to Hulu or Netflix or Amazon Instant Video. So the technology is actually ex expanding opportunities to access your local broadcaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Padden. If I could respond just briefly, you're right. New technology is creating all kinds of wonderful opportunities. Unfortunately, the compulsory license that you've given to the cable industry and the satellite industry, you have not given to the online industry. So, for example, you give the rights to 
broadcast programming to Comcast and to DirecTV, but you don't give it to Netflix. I don't understand why. Um, I'm not advocating that you give it to Netflix. What I'm advocating is you undo the license you have given to cable and satellite that currently puts online distributors at a disadvantage. We're a party, the United States is a party to a number of international treaties that prohibit compulsory licensing of television programming to online providers. So the only way you can level the playing field is by repealing the license for cable and satellite. Um, my time's expired, so thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady, the distinguished gentleman from Virginia.